Um, so, so if you don't already know me, I'm Mia. I'm the new president here. I will be taking over when John leaves. Um, if you don't already know, we have tea, free stickers, free stuff in the back, but anyone is only limited to one stainless steel penny. Or so not stainless. Steel penny. <laughs> um, <laughs> and if you want to enter for the raffle for the bubblehead, just write your name down on the back and we'll do it at the end of this meeting. And today the topic is Raider Athletics, led by our lovely John Wilkie. And ne the next topic for our club will be the Engineering Technology Programs, which is organized by Mitch Hendricks. And the speakers will include Dr. Strangeway, Dr. Chandler, Dr. Kellen Hoffer of the Electrical Engineering Technology Degree Program. And John can take it from here. All right, well thank you for allowing me to present at your meeting, Mia. <laughs> uh, as always, an honor to be here. Um, so this will be a pretty comprehensive overview of our athletics program and I won't be going into like statistics for the most part and specific athletes of course there are standouts that we'll be covering but it's really more about how the university itself has gone through these changes so we'll be starting as always basically the first slide for all of these the early beginnings uh, when we started in 1903 we were very much a technical school and all we had were classes so um, the social programs that came uh, were really more of just students getting together after class and playing ball. Uh, and that's kind of what we observed really uh, for the most part until about the 1910s and 1920s you start seeing more of these teams pop up. And those are the intercollegiate teams that are competing against other schools. Um, so, but very early on we did establish a baseball, basketball, and track team. Um, those were our first three. Uh, we had an intramural volleyball team and uh, football that were popular in the beginning. Um, Oscar Werwath, the founder of MSOE, was basically obsessed with baseball. I don't think he cared too much for football, but he really liked baseball and he instilled that love of baseball into his children, as we'll see later on. Um, so our first teams were, um, as you perhaps could predict, the engineers. Um, the colors were purple and yellow. The yellow was because of lightning and purple because it's the opposite of yellow. Um, we were very into electricity, that's where it came from. I mean, everything here was kind of predictable and obvious. Um, you can see that banner downstairs in that special collections room, and I believe it's from 1916 if I'm not mistaken. Um, so you can see the yellow and purple on it and our old School of Engineering Milwaukee logo. Also down there is uh, Hail SOE, the sheet music, and of course now our pet band, now that Mitch has uh, got them performing it, I guess I'll unmute them. <laughs> We do actually perform it now. And there's lyrics too. If you ever read it, they're, they're not very fun. I guess it's like super dated with the lyrics, so they don't do the lyrics anymore, but they do play the sheet music again. They don't mention woman in the lyrics, and they only mention the electrical engineering program. <laughs> because that's all it was. It was just men and electrical engineers. Yeah. It's all about our coils and sparks and transformers. this like the first day? I think you had like the um, pep rally and then you played we, it at the game. We had the pep like, rally the where we game. took it at half tempo by accident and yeah. we, this is the first time we played it. Yeah, and I was kind to Mitch by picking the recording where they played it decently. The first time was a little rough because it was the first time they played it. You know? I'll take a better recording at the softball game. Sure. If you if you look too, we're actually seated in the wrong order. I was on tuba, so I'm, I was supposed to be in the back. We all just sat backwards. <laughs> so 
So, MSOE did have a football team. This is directly pulled from the library archive blog. So all the credit goes to them. But um, there's a lot of, you know, mistaken folk, lost souls around campus who would say that we have been undefeated in football since 1903, as our beloved bookstore would proudly advertise on t-shirts. But in fact, um, when we started, we did have a football team that played against other schools, and we were not undefeated. <laughs> uh, so that's our 1920 team, although it died off relatively quickly after starting. So we can see the stats here, also from that archive blog. Um, we had a decent team. I mean, we won a good number of games, but we lost to Stevens Point. We lost to St. Louis, uh, so we were not undefeated. Cut um, the team. Cut the and there's the shirt, you know. The, <laughs> the, that's the, if you want the lawsuit, this is all the evidence that you need. <laughs> <laughs> question mark at the end. Yeah. Uh, according to Nick Seidler, MSOE played one American football game against Notre Dame and won. We never played them again, so you could say that we're undefeated against Notre Dame. And I have no evidence to back this up. I could have made this up, but I was told this by Nick Seidler. And he's not here to defend himself, so I don't know. We'll have to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, by 1921, we believe that the football team kind of went away, and it's stated in 1926 that we had a wonderful football team from 1919 to 21, but for several years now we've been without any repre representative athletics. So with that said, the claim that MSOE football is undefeated since 1903 is a little suspect. However, you could say that MSOE is undefeated in football because we were the school of engineering until we became MSOE in the 1930s. So <laughs> by, by being called MSOE in the 1930s, you could say that MSOE is undefeated in football. <laughs> Um, but when you put the 1903 in there, that's when it becomes problematic. Um, through the 1930s, we see even more sports popping up. Um, so the School of Engineering became MSOE and expanded to have basketball, uh, baseball, hockey, tennis, and fencing. So those are the different uniforms that we kind of came up with, always with the lightning bolts in them for our engineers. Um, we got our first gymnasium with the Broadway building, you know, the German English Academy, uh, which we purchased in 1932. And that had a gymnasium in it, and now that area is office space for direct supply if you've ever been in there. Um, but that was our first gym, and you can see the basketball hoop in there. Um, there was also space for working out and space for intramural sports. Um, of course, we later sold the building, and then we got it back only recently through a donation from Dr. Groman. So uh, that's kind of interesting. But by the time we sold it, it was kind of beat up and falling apart. So uh, yeah, there, that is there. But um, this is the oldest building on our campus now, like I as far as some, um, just since we're in the 30s, I have some uh, magazines from the 30s. I have some sports pictures and then that I've marked off where they start, so okay. I don't want to pass them around. There's plenty of other great pictures too if you want to take your time, but there's some really good, especially one of them has some great pictures of the basketball team in like action poses that I think is really fun. get a chance to go into the direct supply building they have kind of on the main set of stairs my husband works in direct supply now so he has access and I've been in there a lot but they have good photos and like a good nice timeline history um, about the building and like its various purchases and forms and just going to and stuff so that's pretty cool if you have a chance to know about yeah all right well I'll keep moving along but uh Feel free to keep looking at those pictures. Um, so 
So then we see intramural softball pop up. That's kind of in the 1940s. Um, so the Brewers at this time period were doing very well, and they were a minor league at the time. Um, but they actually won the minor league World Series in 1947. Uh, also with the advent of the radio, you actually see a lot more interest in sports because up to that point, you would only read scores and read about games in a newspaper, which is not the same as listening to the game or especially watching it. So when you're able to keep up with sports in real time, that kind of puts more interest into sports across the country. Um, so intramural softball was a very big thing back, a, back in the day in the 1940s. And these are pictures um, from the president's picnic and of the intramural uh, softball team. We had eight teams back uh, then, including the electrons and the microwaves. So of <laughs> course, very electrical engineering focused as always. Um, and at the end of the season, like I mentioned, there was the picnic. Um, so there is that. Um, I've gotten the chance to talk to Hans Roeder, who graduated from here in 1955, uh, who was relatively well acquainted with Fred Van Zeeland, um, who back in the day was the director of the electrical education program. Um, he became the dean of students, um, but even early on when he started working at MSOE, uh, he coached the basketball and baseball teams, and I've seen pictures of him around those teams from the 1930s. So even after he graduated, he kind of stuck around before he started working for us as the director of the electrical education program. Uh, so this is a picture from the 1930s of the MSOE baseball team. And you can see Coach Van Zeelen uh, in the center. And uh, Carl Werwath was the manager of the team on the right there. So Carl O. Werwath was the son of Oscar Werwath and became MSOE's second president. But at this point, he was um, managing the team. So I would say Carl Werwath could be considered MSOE's number one fan because um, a story goes that he would attend MSOE games and even stopped at a varsity baseball championship game to check on the score between his wedding ceremony and the reception. <laughs> so, and that's how devoted he was. I mean, Carl Werwath breathed and lived MSOE. Um, and the only reason that he retired from the presidency was that his health was failing from working too hard. Uh, so, we yeah, had that going for him. Um, our next field is going to be the State Street Athletic Field, you know, commonly referred to as the old athletic field until it became renovated. Um, and that was home to the Jefferson Street Grammar School from 1852 until 1978, when it burned down. Uh, and MSOE had been eyeing this property for a long time. We wanted to take it from the school, and when it finally <laughs> burned down, for whatever reason, we acquired the land and turned it into our field. Um, interestingly, the stonework around it was a WPA project from the Great Depression, so that was part of FDR's New Deal. Um, so you can see the plaque for that that's still out there, um, and it's a pretty cool spot. Um, next we get to the MSOE Sports Center, which you can actually look at out that window. It's now the Tenor High School Gymnasium. but. It was part of this cathedral, and uh, MSOE signed a contract in 1976 where we would be able to use this gym, and eventually we leased the property because the group that was connected to whoever owned that building, uh, basically, I think it was a school. The school shut down, and so we were using that gymnasium. We leased the property at that point, but that included um, 
basketball courts, uh, wrestling rooms, athletic areas. And even the first year that we acquired it, it was very popular with students to go there. As you could imagine, having like an indoor uh, gymnasium was very nice. Uh, because at this point, we didn't own that Broadway building anymore. Um, interestingly, my boss at Miller Electric, who I worked for, went to MSOE in the 1990s when we still had that. Uh, that was before the Kern Center. And so he said that when they would play intramural basketball, the ceiling was strangely constructed in it, so it would be raised above yeah. the hoops, but you couldn't throw a shot from the center of the court because the ceiling sunk down in the middle <laughs> with how it was built. Um, so that, that's kind of a bizarre... Way. And you, I mean, you can kind of see that's the inside of it. You can't really see the ceiling that well. Um, about 60% of MSOE students participated in intramural sports and athletic activities in the 1970s, which is pretty impressive. Um, the intramural sports were pretty wide ranging, and there were also a a activities that could be done in that uh, gymnasium building, like uh, weightlifting, table tennis, badminton and there was a whirlpool hot tub. Um, we see that our rowing team starts off around this time period, um, which is pretty cool because it's only recently become kind of a, a big thing that a lot of schools participate in, and it might have actually uh, stopped at some point because they were telling me when I went out with the rowing team my freshman year that it was more of a newer thing and a trend that was spreading out, but MSOE was early on that when they brought it back. Uh, so there is that. Uh, and also, uh, you'll notice that there are women in the pictures now in the 1970s. So we do have some women's sports popping up. By 1974, MSOE joined the NAIC for baseball, basketball, and golf. So this is when our teams start becoming more legit you know, and you might actually start recruiting students for athletics. Um, we've always had, you know, our idea of student athletes where student comes first and then athlete second. But, you know, like with most universities, sports are considered to be pretty important. Um, and this is when we start to really get connected with that stuff. Um, we see the year before, Carl Werwaff retires and Robert Spitzer takes over. Um, around this time period, MSOE is looking into kind of modernizing and refreshing. Um, everyone kind of thought that the engineers was kind of on the nose. It was pretty obvious and it wasn't very creative. So for about three or four years, our team name was the MSOE St. Patrick's and that dates back to our St. Patrick's tradition. Um, strangely, our colors were changed to red and white at this point. Um, you would think it would be green because we would be the St. Patrick's, but we settled on our color scheme back then. Um, the students did not like the new name of uh, the St. Patrick's because the fans of other teams would call us the Patsies, which was a derogatory term. So this was considered bad, you know, by the people. Um, We see kind of a golden age of MSOE athletics in the mid-1980s. So at this point, the golf team finished first in the conference. The baseball team got the conference title for its sixth straight season. So our baseball team was absolutely kicking butt. And our women's volleyball team had its best year of all time, which I don't actually know what that means, but it sounds pretty good. I don't know how long they've been around at this point. Um, and so, what else happened between 1982 and 1983? Well, it's not just these sports, but specifically one team uh, was very big, uh, not only at MSOE, but around the country. So we had a student, Jeff Reservoir, whose jersey has been kindly brought out by uh, Taylor Kelly. Um, and, uh, our basketball team took second in the conference in 1982-83, um, which is pretty good. 
but Jeff Brezovar was the star of the team, scoring an average of 35.8 points per game, which was legitimately the highest in the nation. And over the season, he scored over 1,000 points. Um, and to put that into context, uh, most college basketball players would be considered pretty good if they scored 1,000 points over their entire career. So he did this in one year. Um, so our team gained national recognition, and of course some people would say, well, they're Division Three, you know, they're not playing against very good people, but the, the sheer number of points that Jeff Reservoir scored would be considered massively impressive. Um, and he's still in the MSOE Athletics Hall of Fame and uh, remembered as one of the greats. So that basketball, t oh, okay. I'm not gonna spoil it, I'm not gonna spoil it yet. For whatever reason, Raiders of the Lost Ark, okay? Indiana Jones movie. It's released in 1981. Why does this matter? I don't know. Well, the men's basketball team wrote a letter to George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, and they said, hey, we would like our team to dress up as characters from Raiders of the Lost Ark. And uh, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg say, yes, you can do that. And then they say, well, can we call our team the Raiders after Raiders of the Lost Ark? And George Lucas and Steven Spielberg give them the green light. Um, so we don't know where this letter is. Nick Tyler could not dig it up in the archives. But allegedly it happened. And this is a picture that backs the story up of the team dressed as the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, so at this point, only the basketball team is the MSOE Raiders. Everyone else is the same path still. Uh, by 1983, all of the teams were renamed to the Raiders. Um, you know, I mean, it was kind of cool that we were named after uh, the Raiders from the Indiana Jones movies. <laughs> and um, it's, it was just a lot better than St. Pat's, they thought. So, you know, we went with Raiders. Um, when the next movie comes out, I believe it was Temple of Doom, uh, the team dressed up as that as well. Um, so they continued on with that. Um, so that's kind of where MSOE Raiders comes from. And if you ever talk about this to Nick Seidler, and you call Roscoe a pirate, he becomes rather upset because Roscoe is not a pirate, he's a raider. You know, I mean, pirates just go around the ocean and they pillage and they're lawless, right? But you hire a raider to, you know, find this treasure and, and get a job done, you know? They're very legitimate. So to call Roscoe, or, or whoever the unnamed MSOE Raider at this point is, to call him a pirate would be um, very offensive, you know? <laughs> yes? When did we get Roscoe as the name of our mascot? Well, that's coming up, Angel. Okay, so at okay. this point, it was not Roscoe. We were just the MSOE Raiders, and we did not have a mascot, and we did not even have a logo. So. MSOE says, uh, students, we would like you to design a logo. So according to Lucille Lawless, who was the student life secretary and recently passed away, um, MSOE held a competition for our logo. And this is the winning logo from the competition. Um, it was later found out after they announced that, oh, we have this cool new MSOE Raiders logo, that they just copy-pasted the Tampa Bay Buccaneers <laughs> logo from the 1970s. <laughs> and everyone was really excited with this. They thought it was super badass. And to be fair, it was. But plagiarism at a university is never acceptable. And this is like the number one sin that you could do. So this was not going to fly. And later, MSOE decides that they're going to contract this out now because we can't be trusted with anything. <laughs> so we go to an art firm. And there's two versions. This is kind of the later version that everyone knows. There was a version before that I don't have any pictures of. Um, so in 1994, we got an unnamed pirate as the uh, mascot of the MSOE Raiders. This is the 1996 uh, redesign. And a student named Chad Shea, who graduated in 97, came up with the name Roscoe Raider, and that was a competition. Um, and interestingly, the Milwaukee Admiral's mascot is named Roscoe, and he's also kind of like a pirate captain. But our Roscoe was named before him. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. I can just call it a pirate now. 
Uh, it must have been lost in translation. It's kind of sad that we didn't go more into the Indiana Jones theme. And according to Nick, at one point there was a design of Roscoe where he was in an Indiana Jones outfit with a whip. But we don't know what happened to that. Um, yeah, so that would have been way cooler, right? But um, hey, maybe we'll maybe we'll get them to change it. You know. So these are kind of iterations. <laughs> we still have old Roscoe. Old Roscoe can still be seen around campus. Um, we had different logos for Roscoe, so there he's playing hockey, there was one for baseball, there was one for soccer, and I know this because if you went to Roscoe's cafe in Regent's Hall, there were paintings of Roscoe on the wall doing different sports. Um, so uh, those were painted over when public safety took over, so sad, but um, they do exist and I have pictures of them somewhere, but I couldn't find them in time for this meeting. Dr. Durant sent in our MSOE Historical Society chat his collection of Roscoe Raider bobbleheads. Um, so those were created. Uh, and up next we come to, you know, speaking of bobbleheads. Well, hey, Dan Harris. Dan Harris was UWM's first men's soccer coach starting in 1973. He became UWM's athletic director, and eventually he moved over to Concordia University. Um, and so he was a pretty good athlete on his own, but he went into this space and he did pretty good with it, managed a very good team. Okay, how does Dan Harris factor into MSOE? So he works at UWM, he works at Concordia, and then we pull him over here in 1995. And he becomes MSOE's first athletic director. Um, so up to that point, it was kind of disorganized. It was run by different people, and there wasn't actually an athletics department. And keep in mind that at this time, our only facility for these students is going to be that um, gymnasium that's across the street from us right now. And it was old. It had the ceiling where you couldn't really play a proper basketball game in it because it was low in the middle. Um, and the building was just kind of getting old. So at this point, that's what we were dealing with. And through his career, not only do we have more sports teams added to our roster, so we started from 13, and uh, by the end we had 22, but we also saw the Kern Center and Meath's Field get built under his observation. And of course, he wasn't the architect for it, but he was in charge of the program that would oversee that. So um, Dan Harris was a very important figure in MSOE history. And he only passed away recently as well. Um, so that's where the bobblehead comes from. Uh, I don't know if there's any fun facts on here that I should read out. Uh, yeah, I mean, he was the first varsity men's soccer coach at UWM, served as UWM's athletic director, um, did the same thing at Concordia and Mac One before coming to MSOE. And he's in several Hall of Fames. He's in the UWM Hall of Fame, Concordia Hall of Fame, his uh, high school Hall of Fame, uh, Wisconsin Soccer Association Hall of Fame, um, Milwaukee Kickers, which is a children's soccer team. He, he's uh, in their Hall of Fame. And also, um, whatever division we're in for hockey has the Dan Harris Cup. Uh, I believe. So that's like the award that you win for hockey in our division. It's named after him. So he's not only an MSOE icon, but a Milwaukee icon and a legend, if you will. Up next, another legend, Jimmy Banks, who led MSOE's soccer team from 1999 until his death in 2019. Not as a player, but as a coach. So he was a coach here. And before he coached at MSOE, he was on Team USA, and he played in the FIFA World Cup for two games in uh, 1990. So Jimmy Banks grew up in MS uh, He grew up in Milwaukee, went through Milwaukee schools, um, made a name for himself playing soccer, 
Uh, he made his way up to Team USA, and then he came to MSOE. So maybe a surprising decision, but uh, certainly appreciated. Um, let's see here. You can find a lot more about uh, Jimmy Banks online, and of course, now in the Kern Center, you can see that we have a commissioned mural of uh, Jimmy Banks. So uh, in 2002, Jimmy Banks was one of the honorees in the Decade of U.S. Soccer Celebration held in the nation's capital. So he was nationally recognized. Uh, he's an inducted member of the UW-Milwaukee Athletics Hall of Fame, Custer High School Hall of Fame, Wisconsin Soccer Association Hall of Fame, and he volunteered a lot with new soccer programs. In 2019, Jimmy Banks unfortunately passed away from cancer. So that is why he was recognized with his artwork. In 2004, MSOE constructed the Kern Center. This was kind of a project that we've been working on for a while. Um, so not even like through the early 2000s, but I'm talking like mid-1990s. We wanted to build this Kern Center, and we actually secured a lot of the funding from Robert Kern at this point. But uh, just, just getting the land was very difficult. So um, like Rick and Nick uh, went over at our last meeting, um, we had to do a little shenanigans with getting people to vote for aldermen and get approval from the city of Milwaukee to get it. Um, but eventually we did. And we were fighting against Grace Lutheran Church to get this land because they wanted to put Grace Place where the current center is. And um, they were saying that they were planning on doing it, that they had the money when they didn't. you know. So they were kind of bluffing with that. Um, but they were very hardly lobbying the city to where they would get that land. Um, and uh, eventually they did build the Grace Place behind the church. So everyone was happy in the end, you know, it all worked out well. Um, you can see Robert Kern there again, he recently passed away, and um, that's the groundbreaking of the Kern Center uh, when it was started and the render of what it would look like from 2004. So pretty accurate. But Uh, this is another thing that you can read about on the archive blog and from onmilwaukee.com. When we were planning out our current center, we also uh, solicited a contract from Santiago Calatrava, who designed the Milwaukee Art Museum. So we would be the first city to have two Calatrava buildings in it, um, one being the MSOE Kern Center and the other being the Art Museum. Um, and you can see that this is indeed the Kern Center because the Grace Lutheran Church is very obviously there. And um, maybe we were just messing with them at that point because we knew that they wanted the land. We'll put them in our model and everything. <laughs> <laughs> but the model was created in 1999. So this was something that we've, we've been planning for quite a while. Um, by the point that this design came out, we'd already had $9 million pledged from the Robert and Patricia Kern Family Foundation. And our wonderful Eckhart Broman said that he would throw down one to two million dollars for just buying up the land. Um, Kaladrava received a honorary degree from MSOE as well uh, around this time period. Wasn't he just here? I don't know. They just did that article. On I thought he was back in the city. They did an article on him recently, and they like wanted to take pictures and stuff from our archive because I think he was back in Milwaukee okay. visiting, and so they wanted to show. You know, things that we have kept. He's apparently like really legendary for like spending too much money. Yeah. So that might be why we didn't go for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would be kind of ridiculous for what it was, you know, a very over engineered building. Um, and then 2013, we see Beach Field. So, uh, Beach Field was, and, and still is, it's a parking garage that holds 780 people, and we have a field on top of it, which kind of makes for an interesting experience when you're watching soccer games, because sometimes the players will kick a ball off the field, and it goes down like three stories. So, um, if you didn't know, we actually hire students to be at games on ball duty, where they'll watch the ball and run out of the stadium and grab it, 
and hopefully it doesn't hit a car or whatever. <laughs> but they have to chase after it because these balls, like the um, collegiate certified balls, cost like three hundred dollars a piece. So you don't want them just flying around, <laughs> you know. Um, but the Beats Field was finished in uh, 2013. It was the first all LED lit competition field in the United States, which is pretty cool. And this was finished while Herman Beats was still president of MSOE. So it was named after our current president at the time. Yes? The uh, apparently part of the reason why we got the land to build this field on so easily was because Wisconsin Highway 145 didn't come in on McKinley Street. It was actually its own freeway called the Park East Freeway yeah. that went across that very land. So we ended up with the land after the Wisconsin Department of Transportation took down the freeway. Yeah, there used to be a freeway that practically ran through our campus that is completely gone now. And uh, if you ever look at satellite views of the area, you can see where the freeway is and where it divided groups of people. Um, but there used to be just a whole like tall freeway structure that ran through that area. Um, and it was only very recently, like, you know, late 1990s when that actually came down. Because that's still when my boss from Miller, you know, when he was here, that, that, was, uh, that was still there. I also heard from my husband about Beatsfield that apparently the school wanted to build both a soccer field stadium mm -hmm. sure. and a parking structure like separately mm -hmm. and the city wouldn't give them permission to do they said you can have one or the other and yeah. then they said well what if we did both and then the <laughs> city was like sure why not and they right. let them build mm -hmm. that structure because they needed both things but they couldn't get permission to do both at the same time basically so then they just said screw you we'll do both <laughs> at the same time i don't know how true that is but he's always told me that yeah. Um, I guess, you know, it sounds like a good idea, but one story that I've heard is that um, when they were repainting the lines on Beats Field, um, there were cars parked in there, and a lot of the white paint actually dripped through the play field onto the cars, and that cost MSOE a lot of money. That was kind of a disaster. Um, so we now uh, require people to leave the parking complex when we repaint the field. Um, also, I heard that SAE uh, tested their formula hybrid car in uh, the Beats parking complex where it was drifting around cars and then I was told that they were banned by public safety from ever test driving a car <laughs> in Beats field again. Um, so uh, with all the SAE teams I've you know been a part of in one way or another, uh, they've not been able to do anything in Beats field. <laughs>In 2015, Dan Harris retired from MSOE. That's after 20 years here, a 50-year career in total. Um, so he, he had a very positive outlook on the department as he left. And on April 14, 2022, Dan Harris passed away. Um, in 2018, we see a new look emerge for MSOE athletics. So we have new Roscoe here, which you can actually buy for $350 from mascotchief.org if you look up stubborn pirate mascot costume. So now, now Roscoe is canonically a pirate. Um, you know, before when we made our own Roscoe mascot, we could argue he was a raider. He's a southern pirate? Stubborn pirate. Oh, stubborn pirate. <laughs> so stubborn southern. pirate. Like, yeah. And then we see the two sword MSOE Raiders logo. Because by this point, the teams were saying that Roscoe's face was not very cool or intimidating, and they wanted something that would be, you know, have a little more oomph to it. More so then we had the, the cross swords and MSOE Raiders. So that came out just a year before I started going. Um, in 2019, MSOE had a partnership with uh, a high school, a uh, Nicollet High School, where we uh, had MSOE Raider Stadium built kind of out in uh, Glendale, Wisconsin. So we paid for a lot of the renovation with that. We added lighting, uh, scoreboard, uh, various things like that. Um, and the same people who funded this also funded our, our softball field for the most part. 
Um, and it's kind of interesting that our baseball field is off campus and our softball field is on campus. But as you'll remember, intramural softball was very popular in the early days of MSOE when we started to acquire the field. So that may have played some part into that. And you can't use a baseball field as a softball field or vice versa. There are small but uh, distinct differences. In 2022, MSOE and UWM played uh, a game at American Family Field for the first time. And that's something that we're planning on doing again. So I was involved with the panel that kind of planned this out. Um, I'm kind of involved with it this year, but because we figured everything out last year, we're kind of not going through the whole planning stage again. Um, but very one-sided. I mean, the MSOE logo is so much smaller than the UWM <laughs> one. I mean, it's not like it's their stadium, you know? I mean, how come they get that? But I guess they treated it like it was UWM's home game in uh, uh, American Family Field, um, which I had to pause to not say Miller Park. Um, <laughs> and that's what the ticket looked like. It was April 27, 2022. Um, that's us having a beer with Dr. Walls behind us. Um, so, there we go. Uh, up to basically now, MSOE Field, we're just uh, finishing it up now. Still a little bit of work to be done. Uh, MSOE Field uh, is uh, a massive renovation of our old softball field, which back in the day really had issues with drainage. You know, it would kind of get flooded and muddy. So it didn't make a very good field for the softball team. Um, but before it was renovated, it was a very popular green space for students and locals to kind of walk their dog and poop on our field. Um, so now we have fences around it. We've invested a lot of money in this. Um, when they announced this plan, uh, some students kind of pushed back on it because of the fences and because they would be removing trees and things. Um, and it really was a useful green space for students. I mean, you had disc golf, poops, and other things. So during this announcement, they, they did reiterate and clarify that you know, after getting the pushback from students, they said that MSOE will retain our sand volleyball court, frisbee golf holes, walking paths and green space. And uh, the president announced that the fences would be opened when the team wasn't playing and other things to uh, address the concerns that were raised by students. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, sand volleyball uh, cord is gone for now. We'll see if they put it back. The trees were cut and uh, the disc golf hoops are gone. So we'll see what happens. Of course, it's still under construction, so maybe they'll put it back after removing it. I don't know. They'll put the trees back, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they'll put the trees back too. I don't know. But um, yeah, I mean, there was just a softball game today at the new field, and it's looking pretty good. You know, it looks like a good spot. So definitely a good thing for our softball team. And um, uh, right now the big push with that is also attracting more female students to MSOE, and especially female athletes. So previously when we had um, MLH and, and uh, RWJ, um, that's kind of where all the athletes would be. And then we had honor students in Groman Tower. Uh, now we put the honor students from Groman Tower into Beats Tower and we're using our three residence hall floors of Groman Tower exclusively for female athletes. And so, you know, we can offer that when we're recruiting students to say that you can have an apartment style place for the same price as a dorm um, if you're an athlete at MSOE. So that's a big push. And also we're adding a few more women's teams um, to the MSOE roster. So that's uh, kind of our latest initiative is uh, going deeper into that, uh, Mitch. If you look, if you look at the current center layout, the room that they're actually using for, the room that they're actually changing into the women's locker room, they might have finished renovations by this point. For these new programs, was a dance studio that was previously also used for music program rehearsals. Mm -hmm. Also, I think they're having an event that was the grand opening of that field in like a couple weeks from now. I think it's on like May sixth or something on Saturday. The pet band will be there so you get to hear the school song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it was supposed to be on April Fool's Day. Mm -hmm. I, I kid you not. 
and then they realized that it was over a break and nobody would be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do remember that. All right, so with that, you any other questions or comments? It'll be interesting to see if anybody from Stritch, from the softball team, comes over. Sure. They yeah. have a, I used to work there, so they have a pretty, and they had a pretty decent softball team and, you know, a decent, half-decent nursing program. So it'll be interesting to see if any of those because they have a lot of local Wisconsin athletes, so they decide to come here and get their clothing. Yeah. So. Yeah. I could do a whole meeting on just times MSOE almost closed. That would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> but um, yeah, I guess. Uh, Taylor, do you have? Would you like to come up and show off the things? That you yeah. Have? So yeah, over the not too long ago, we actually received these. Um, they're a little bit heavy, so I might just have you guys come up and look at them. Oh, sure. These um, framed uh, jerseys from three different people who are in the Athletic Hall of Fame. And I also brought the Athletic Hall of Fame Charter Induction um, Program. So the three people who are on here were part of that first uh, induction into the Hall of Fame here at MSOE. And so there's um, Jeff Reservoir, who we talked about. pictures of everybody at the bottom and they're all really 80s and cool looking. And yeah, then, the um, men all have yeah <laughs> except for Ruth Ann Lund but she has a pretty cool mullet. Um, she was someone who was on the volleyball team and the softball team and I think had records for both teams. And then Brian Gertz or Gertz or whatever he's also has a cool mustache and uh, I believe he was on the uh, basketball team. So, um, yeah, if you can take a look at those, are, it's kind of neat seeing an old, an old style. Yeah, it lists their honors and then their career records. Yeah, I like um, Ruth Ann Lund led the volleyball team in kills in 1987 and 1980, which I don't know what that means, but that's a pretty, uh, if I remember correctly, I think that's when you, like... When you kill somebody. Well, yeah, when you murder somebody. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure it's when you, like, uh, stop, you know, like, stop a, like, a literal volley. Okay, you know? cool. Yeah, so if you want to come take a look at those, um, they got some interesting facts on them. Oh, she did softball too. She's got softball stuff. Yep, yeah, softball and volleyball. Nice. Um, and we can also take a look at this too if you want to see who else got in that year. Um, yeah, so I'll just leave that right here. Thank you. Thank of course. You. All right. Well, Angel, did you take pictures of that stuff? Or no, I haven't taken pictures of that. Pictures. Ah, very cool. Of course, uh, the 75 and 100 year book, MSOE Volume 1, which is a yearbook they put together in 1989, the MSOE Archives blog, and a big thank you to Nick Seidler and Jackson Scamberg. A lot of the information that I relayed to you today came from Nick Seidler, and I eventually confirmed with these other works, but um, that was an interview that I did last year, and uh, that's where I basically heard everything that I told you today. So I want to make sure that Nick gets credit, especially because he uh, is not here today. So big shout out for that. Of course, Nick is very busy planning for Consinity, which is happening this Saturday uh, from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Yes, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, are you this? You're, you're not the CEO of that, right? You just took over. No, H. Nick or Nick, Nathan's the chair for Consinity. Okay, mm -hmm. so. Something worth going to, MSOE's gaming, anime, other things convention. <laughs> the theme this year is B horror movies. Cool. All right, so with that, thank you all for coming. Um, but before you go, if you want to stick around for that bobblehead drawing, the main attraction here, <laughs> I'll get our list of people. And if you're not on this list and you want to be on the list, please let me know now. Okay, sounds like everyone's on the list. Do you two want to be on the list? 
Oh, no, I'm good. Okay. Are the meetings set at Tuesdays now? Question mark? Uh, kind of. Allegedly. <laughs> the uh, electrical engineering technology programs might be kind of stuck because one of the professors for that doesn't have anything on Tuesday at all because he might he goes to all the tech colleges and stuff because there's a transfer program with all the tech colleges for the EE program mm -hmm. so he's in charge of that so he's got to visit literally a bunch of tech colleges so if, there's, mm -hmm. if he's out of town you're going to move it I got a problem with that okay here it is our true random number <laughs> generator <laughs> boy <laughs> Oh, nice. number. All right, number one, Mia Hotstetler. You win our MSOE Dan Harris bobblehead. All right, congratulations. If you would like to hold it up to the camera, you may. Show them off. Oh, no, no, you got to really get up there. I mean, this thing, you have to get a document, this thing. Yes, there it is. Give it a nice shake of the head, you know. All the angles. Does it really bobble? No. Not really, no. <laughs> this is kind of interesting. The, the Bobblehead Hall of Fame Museum is in the third ward. It's only a few minutes from here. And when they were first getting off the ground, we commissioned a few of those bobbleheads. Um, so that's kind of how that came to be. So that yes. can stay in the historical society. Yes. 